Okay, uh, great. So, um, yeah, so I wanted to talk to you today about uh, embracing serverless operations. Uh, this is a talk I previously gave at DevOps Days um, MSP. Um, so, um, yeah, my background, uh, so I'm the founder, co-founder, uh, CTO of IO Pipe. Uh, and we're providing um, observability, monitoring, debugging, profiling for Amazon Lambda. Um, my background is in building clouds, building um, automation, right? Um, so for 15, 17 years, I was doing this. Um, I was early at Docker and early in OpenStack where I was maintainers. Um, but we have this new thing, right, serverless, right? And what is serverless? Um, it's not um, that we have no servers, um, although the gifts are really hilarious. Um, it's a tool, right? Um, it's a tool for building applications on this new platform. But it's more than that. It's, it is a platform, um, but it's more than just a platform. Um, it's an approach to building your applications. Um, it's a process by which you build and design these applications. And it's an architecture. It's um, collaborative services. It's, um, micro it's more than microservices, it's nanoservices, right? And it's more than that. Um, you know, and it's event-driven. It is this idea that we hand off data to these ephemeral processes that come and before you know it, they're gone. Right? And it's a culture, it's a movement. Um, serverless comp, reInvent, um, you know, we've been building these communities of uh, serverless practitioners, and you know, serverless and DevOps go together so well because it is empowering of your users. It eliminates um, struggles that your developers have to shipping, building, running those applications allows you, just like going from EC2, uh, from physical machines to EC2, right? It empowered your developers, that self-service allowing agility that you didn't have before. Um, going to Docker um, from VMs empowered your, your developers, empowered you in this room. And serverless does the same thing. It breaks down the pieces smaller into functions so that you are more empowered to build and ship things, not at an application layer, but at a per function layer that um, every change that you make, every function that you modify can be shipped and run independently, right? So we have a convergence of tools and processes with serverless. So this is my diagram of a classic ops story developers would build applications, and they would you know, compile it, ship it. <laughs> and shipping it was giving it to an operator who would go buy a machine and stand it up and install it, and hopefully we don't change it too often because this was really painful. Um, right? And we said, well, this is a manual process. It's really slow. It's really painful. Let's change it. Let's fix it. Let's improve it. Continuous deployment. So the operator is handed off. Um, the processes to develop um, to developers where they provided systems, right? You provided systems to developers and said, okay, now you can deploy your applications on your own. You don't have to bother me anymore, right? Um, we have done a DevOps. Um, developers aren't managing or operating their code, but the deployment is easy, right? And it's the same pattern as before, but we've added automation. And the automation is, let's see, reading my notes, if there's anything I want to say. Um, right, so the system engineers may still be needed for components and depth of operational knowledge and existent, um, experience, but like, there's so much more we can do to this, right? And you realize that while continuous deployment is useful, it isn't necessary to complete the intended goal of replacing dedicated operations teams. The goal isn't to eliminate operators, but to eliminate the necessity for them. The need to operate still exists, but it's consultatory. It returns to a role of support rather than one of active engagement. So your systems engineers can walk away and 
developers can mostly operate on their own, right? You know, this is like a really good, strong DevOps story where, yes, systems engineers, okay, they still exist, right? Operations still exist, but developers, you could be empowered to monitor application, to be on call for your own applications, and not somebody who knows nothing about your application. Because I remember doing ops 10 years ago and having somebody call and say, my application's down. I'm like, okay, well, great. What's wrong with it? Right? And they're like, well, you should know. You're operating it. I'm like, but I don't, I didn't write this application. I don't know why you wrote a bad SQL query, right? Like, I don't know why you're consuming all of this memory. I mean, I know it's consuming all this memory. Why is it consuming all this memory, right? Those are like, you know, and there was that frustration and anger between these two camps. And passing, you know, that to developers were developers who know why their application might perform this way and empowering them to see that their things are not working and why they're not working, allowing them to, de to fix them um, was radical, right? And continuing this further and eliminating just simply um, operations tools and making the process of being able to build, ship, and run your applications on your own laptop and have that to be the same as in the cloud. We've done a Docker, um, right? But scaling, capacity management, et cetera, is still hard. So we still need the operators to now run our container management systems. And you know, we've changed the system, and, but many of these problems still exist, right? Operations hasn't gone away, but Operations has changed. Developers are doing things that operators traditionally did, and operators are doing new things. They're like running Kubernetes in production. Yay. Um, right? But then also things fail. Containers die. Their re retries are exceeded, and they don't come back. Applications in containers hang. So things still break, like even outside of the Kubernetes side, right? The application breaks in ways that we're not enabled to fix easily. There's the 12-factor app. Please don't read all of these. Um, you can find it on the internet. Um, you know, Docker and modern infrastructure we introduced the 12-factor app. And you know, I, I kind of criticized this when it came out for not being enough. That there were a lot of things here that, not that they're not on the slide, right? They're, they're not in these words. It's that they're implied. They're implicit rather than explicit. Immutability is a thing that we determined was necessary in building these applications, but it doesn't say immutability anywhere on here, right? It says things like event streams. Well, event streams are immutable. Event streams are always an immutable thing, right? Events are always immutable, but it doesn't say immutable, right? So, um, you know, I think the interpret some of these things are lost in the interpretation because they're not said explicitly. Um, and these are necessary for building these applications so that they're you know, they can be cloud native and they can be redundant and they can be stable and highly scalable. Um, and then with serverless, we have the serverless manifesto. Uh, and I added functions here because serverless can be seen as more than just functions as a service. S3 is serverless, right? You know, uh, raise your hand if you ever scaled the number of shards supporting your S3 bucket. Right? Like, you don't need to do that. Um, all of that is completely transparent. And that's the thing about Amazon Lambda, is that it's totally transparent. You, you don't have to scale the containers. I mean, I have tools that I can give you, right? You can, you can go to my website, you can sign up, and then you can see how many containers are running your app. But Amazon doesn't tell you. And, you know, from a certain perspective, you kind of don't need to know. Right, when you need to know are things like, why do I have a memory leak? Um, things like, how do I debug this, you know, SQL, uh, you know, this, this, this bad SQL query that I put into my application, right? Things like that, which you definitely need to know, but aren't necessarily need to know from the infrastructure layer. So, you know, Amazon Lambda kind of offered this model to compute that we had with S3. Right? S3 gave us all this power to just not worry about things, put it into storage, 
and get paid for the gigabyte and pay for, for the day. And that's exactly what we do with Lambda. We just took the, Amazon took the S3 model and they applied it to your compute. Um, and some of those things here are not explicit, like immutability. But the amazing thing about Lambda was that because they controlled the implementation, they did the best practices. They did those things. They didn't describe it. They didn't explain it um, very well. But they did it, and they made it by default. So all of those doctor best practices, all of those microservices best practices, all those things that I've been up on stage for the last three years or whatever since when I started at Docker and before I was at Docker, trying to get people to go to containers. And people are like, well, we really could use a thing called Docker. Um, right? And you know, those things, all those best practices, well, now Lambda has encapsulated those and forced them upon you and said, well, deal with it. Um, and it's amazing because now we have this true convergence of those tools. Um, the applications and infrastructure handles the monitoring. Uh, monitoring has converged with developer tools. Um, right? I feel that things like Kubernetes are trying to accomplish this. They're trying to simplify this process. Um, Kubernetes has a lot of things like configuration management kind of built into it already. Um, but like Lambda, provides all of this as a service completely out of the box. And you know, this is not just facilitated by better tooling, but smarter platforms, right? Um, let's see. So yeah, over time, and up the stack operations tools become developer tools. So who here has ever seen this slide? <laughs> um, if you've ever been to another DevOps days or a lot of DevOps uh, meetups, it's a pretty common, popular slide. I, I think Andrew Schaefer might have come up with it, but uh, maybe Patrick Deboy. I'm not sure where it came from. But um, you know, there's this whole story of how do you kind of get from drawing the circles to drawing the owl, right? And it's a lot of work. Well, um, it makes some people upset, um, especially with um, my text that ran over the, the picture, um, right? So, you know, don't build when you can buy, build as little as necessary, and build with the minimal operational complexity, right? Maybe all you need are some circles. Maybe you don't need to draw the owl, right? You know, we're just drawing the, the, the circles, right? Each little circle, every stroke is a, is a function. It's a lambda function, and you can build it slowly. And over time, you know, you build an application. You don't need to draw the owl all at once. You can draw you know, each circle, you can draw each stroke and build your application slowly. Um, and serverless really empowers you to do that more so than ever because it's so granular in its development cycle and its presentation. Um, and we can also know, right, like with these circles, like it's definitely not a snake, right? Like, you know, and maybe it's not yet an owl, but it's not a snake. And sometimes that's enough. So um, I'm also running really fast. So, um, so this is an application that um, we're, we're actually running this at IOPipe. We're still running it. Um, this is an old, old screenshot. So you know, none of those metrics are valuable anymore. Um, it's immutable. Um, but this is the API that accepts data via post requests and puts the data into Amazon Kinesis. So Kinesis is a lot like Kafka. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Kinesis, but um, I see a couple of hands. Well, it basically takes data in, ingests it, and it's like kind of a replayable, malleable event queue-ish thing. So you can, data goes in, and you can have readers that come off of it. Um, and then they can kind of reset their iterators and replay events, and it has kind of like almost like a backup built into it, which is really, really nice. Um, but what we do is we ingest data through here. So when uh, customer data comes in, we put it into Kinesis, and then we have multiple readers that come off and do things with the data, like put it into a database, uh, or do things like trigger our alerts. Um, so we had to, you know, we stood up an application in Elastic Beanstalk. That's what you're looking at here, Elastic Beanstalk console. Um, so we're managing our VMs that way, uh, not worrying about containers and stuff because it's honestly a pain in the ass. Um, 
and it's just convenient just throw in Elastic Beanstalk and Amazon just takes care of it for us. It's a platform, um, right? But there's instances and those instances can break and they can run at a disk space and a whole series of operational concerns exist because we are managing this application. And all it does, it's take a post request and inserts it into a queue, right? So like there's no way we can do this, right? We could just not write code. We could, um, we can go into Amazon, use API Gateway, and it allows you to kind of do some basic manipulation. You can take a request and you can serialize it um, and make it a field of a JSON document, um, which gets passed to some other backend proxy or it gets passed to another Amazon service. So you can actually um, use API Gateway to talk to any of the Amazon APIs and take incoming requests and map that data using templates that write to um, those backend services. So what we could do here is we could just pay for API Gateway, which is kind of expensive, but um, it's a lot less expensive than running all those VMs and all those other things that you need 24-7 uh, when this is fully burstable, fully scalable. It just handles it. You know, it's basically running it almost like in your, it's basically running it in a CDN, right? You're just saying, hey, CDN, can you just like, take those requests and send them to that server there. Um, oh, and just make this little tiny change in the payload um, in the request. And so you can do that. And you know you pay like, I don't know, like 50 cents per million calls or something. Like, you know, it's expensive, but it's pretty cheap for what it does. Um, the main reason we don't do this is because um, we need very, very low latency. Um, but we could totally do this, right? And this is a really great way of getting started. We did, we, you wouldn't have to build an API. You, you wouldn't have to deploy the API, manage all the operational concerns. You could build this in half an hour, an hour, just go through the Amazon console. You don't even need a bunch of tools. And, um, you know, and move off of it when you find that it doesn't work and you need VMs for some reason, right? Because, I don't know, you need a post handler that, like, does basically nothing, but it just needs that low latency and needs to be an EC2. Um, so, right, there are these operational concerns, however, still for serverless. So, yes, okay, we can eliminate that complexity of running those VMs. We can eliminate the complexity that things are going to die. We can eliminate the complexity that um, things, the VMs are never kind of fully immutable. But Lambda does have some concerns that we have to know about. Give it a 75 gigabyte limit for all functions. Um, five minute maximum duration currently. This will eventually raise, I've been promised. Um, I can't say when to or to how much, but um, I think it's promising that we'll see some improvements on this over time, especially given that there's multiple platforms and they're going to, some people try to make a differentiator. We could run for, you know, seven minutes, right? Like, okay. You know, Amazon can always increase it. Um, <laughs> you know, tw 20 milliseconds for hello world, right? So you want to run a hello world function, it takes about 20 milliseconds. Um, I think this will also probably get faster over time. We have seen this get faster over time already, um, which is why I'm confident in saying we'll get better. Um, but that's like really important, right? Like this stuff is relatively fast, um, could be faster, but when you write your code, you want to make it faster, you're handling events you get uh, 120 megs to 1.5 gigabytes of memory. If you undersize your tier, you're going to get out of memory. Um, if you're out of memory on every invocation, your application just won't run. If you have a memory leak, well, you know, every X number of events are going to fail to be processed and it's gonna retry and it's gonna then take longer and et cetera, right? So like these are concerns that you need to be aware of. You need to have tooling that lets you know, well, um, I have a memory leak, and you know, like, who who, wa who wants to pay for a higher tier to have like their app? Let's say you consume 128 megs of RAM, but you pay for the 1.5 gigabyte tier because you have a memory leak, and that means that instead of every five minutes you have an error, you get an error only every four hours, right? Like that sounds like a solid plan. Um, 
right? Or, or you know, we can like have tools that fix these problems for us. Um, right, you get a thousand containers maximum by default for all of your lambdas. So there's basically a pool that says, we have a container cloud that can support this many containers, and however many invocations of whichever functions you have, use that pool. Um, you can get this increased by Amazon, but like you need to know, like, am I hitting that limit? When am I gonna hit that limit? Um, maybe you want to call Amazon early and get that bumped up before it becomes a problem. And tools, again, to let you know that it's gonna happen. Uh, functions are lazy loaded from S3. Um, this is one that's pretty transparent, like invisible to users, right? You upload your files, like Lambda at least, you upload the data to S3, your function is run. If, it's use, if it has to spawn a new container to handle the load, which happens whenever there's like uh, unexpected concurrency, so if there's more concurrency requested than Amazon currently has containers running for you already for that function, then it's going to lazy load for S3. It's going to actually start a new container and it's going to do the equivalent of like a Docker pool, but it does it by downloading from S3 and unpacking a zip file. Um, this is very slow, it turns out, where uh, we use Node.js and we found that web packing our builds from like literally like maybe like five files into one file affected us by hundreds of milliseconds for those lazy loads, right? And if we're building something like an Alexa skill that needs to return within two seconds or the Alexa times out and then yells at you and then your application is rejected from the app store, um, right? Like these are things that have actual business use cases that you need to know why it's failing and know that you can like, I don't know, webpack your stuff or that you should webpack your stuff. And that if you're not using a language where you can do things like webpacking, then I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you're just gonna have to not use modules in Python. You're just gonna have to like write everything all at once, I don't know. Um, right, uh, containers and processes are long lived, automatically scaled, and garbage collector uh, every four and a half minutes to four and a half hours. So like if you're thinking about things like memory leaks, um, that's kind of what you're looking at is that, okay, well maybe I don't care about memory leaks. If I, if I run every eight hours, I don't have to worry about memory leaks because I'm like, it's only ever going to run once in the same container. Uh, but these are the kind of things that, again, tools let you know, and that's why operations is still important. Um, pauses and pauses and containers between events. Um, kind of an advanced use case um, to really care about this necessarily, but you, you can't run an agent. You can't just fork some code and say, oh, well, you know, um, I'm just gonna run this backend process, you know, while those Amazon's running, managing those containers for me for the next, you know, year. Uh, you can't do that. It, it only, even if you, fork out code, it's only going to run during your invocation. It'll actually pause the, um, pause the code with uh, the CPU call. Uh, you get a non-root user, um, slash is read only, temp is 512 megs max, right? Also, um, leaks into temp, right? You keep writing files in a temp. Um, if those files are big enough, uh, over four and a half hours, four, four, four and a half hours, you could totally run out of disk space. Um, you know, keep it in mind. So like, again, tools that let you know that these things are happening are still important. Operations is not dead. No ops doesn't exist, right? Operations still exist, um, but you need to be aware of them. So, all right, now I'm back on track with time. So, profiling Lambda in the cloud. So, uh, one of the things that I've done um, to get some more visibility is profiling this code. Um, so this is actually the, the base V8 profiler. Um, we just published to GitHub, um, I didn't update my slides. So uh, GitHub io.com slash io pipe slash V8 profiler dash lambda is a virtual package um, that if you import that, um, it will automatically compile, it'll automatically compile and build the libraries for your local system and all of the versions of Node that run on Lambda so that you can import that and then test locally and, and in the cloud and do profiling. Uh, it gives you these API calls. 
Um, and there's others, of course, but these are the ones that you care about. Start profiling and stop profiling. Um, we built a plugin for IOPipe. So IOPipe provides a decorator function, um, a wrapper function around your code, um, and we have a plugin mechanism. So this plugin um, basically says, okay, um, before your Lambda starts and after it exits, um, profile the code. So we actually do this before we exit back to Lambda. So your code runs its callback or does its return, and then we run this code, and then we tell Lambda that you're done. Um, and you, so yeah, so you basically um, wrap the code this way, and so your code basically here is this um, context wow, and it just you know basically just returns that as a return value, you say wow, and then you get a profile. So what I did was um, I built a Slack bot, um, and I probably actually do have the time to demo it, but I don't have it prepped. So I'm going to skip the full demo. But the, what the thing with the Slack bot did was it has, um, who's here seen the new Star Wars trailer, right? Uh, Porgs. So Porgs are these little um, penguin um, gizmo gremlin things. Um, they're the new Ewoks. And I said, okay, well, it's a Slack bot where you can overlay text just like the old Doge images. And so you type in slash, um, slash porg with some text, and it takes the image and it overlays some, some of the text that you wrote, and it's a whole Slack bot. And Slack has to respond within two and a half seconds. So, you know, like the image that I generated was this, and the, this is basically a Slack bot. The problem was it wasn't returning within the two seconds that Slack expects. Well, okay, why? So we can open up the Chrome DevTools. And we can go to the profiler. And I'm going to actually do it. I'm going to actually go to the profiler. And so we then load, which I already have it loaded here, but I can do load, um, load the porg thing, right? So, okay. Oh, you cannot see my window. This one? <laughs> Perfect. Oh, that's really, really tiny. Hold on. OK. So um, I go to the, prof the Chrome profiler. I do a load. I'm going to reload the file. I just load it. I load a CPU profile. So basically, um, what I did was my Slack bot, when it ran, I, had it, I attached the profiler to it. And I said, OK, well, why is it? not responding within two seconds. Okay, well, first of all, straight off the bat, I can see it took about two and a half seconds. So Slack complained and said we have a timeout. Um, and what is this dwell time? That is a huge dwell time. We could probably um, optimize that a little bit. Um, and we can kind of dig in here. And doing this on the second screen is kind of weird. So scroll down. Okay, so spawn. So this application is using image magics, and it looks like um, the process of writing that file into temp um, is probably what's happening, because we write the file into temp, um, and then we do a bunch of things, like this does TLS negotiation S3 and uploads to S3. The S3 stuff seems like it's pretty fast. Uh, we could probably optimize running that to, to disk. Um, instead of writing a disk, maybe we can write the memory, um, which would be, of course, a lot faster. Or maybe uh, we could just use a smaller file. Um, and because, like, I think that the file was like, I don't know, um, like a five megapixel file or something. You could, like, make that a lot smaller, and it's going to write less the disk, or maybe we just write the memory, right? And, like, we can kind of dig in here and see exactly what's happening in that Lambda. And if you didn't have tools like this, then you wouldn't be able to debug it. So let's go back. We're pretty much done. And I don't know what I have for time because I lost my thing, but uh, that's basically it. So thank you. Hi. Um, I'm currently uh, have a serverless app in production. So can you just repeat that link to the VA profiler that you Sorry? use? Can you just repeat the link to the VA profiler that you were mentioning? Um, yeah, so the productized version of that um, is 
entering beta um, very shortly. Um, we have a GitHub module, which is um, what we call the low-level library uh, that we're using to build our profiling tool, uh, and that's on GitHub, and that's um, iopipe slash v8 dash profiler dash lambda. And again, that's the low-level library that you would use to build a more, more cohesive tool, um, which we have that kind of productized tool coming very shortly, um, and we're going to provide a beta to interested users. It seems like this; these tools are like very powerful, but it also seems like they're, uh, it's like a lot of abstraction on top of the server. Would you ever recommend this approach to a beginner? Like earlier, somebody said, you know, the first thing is setting up an EC2. Would you ever say, no, just do a Lambda and you got your whole server? Um, I would never recommend to a beginner that they set up an EC2 server, right? Um, I would hesitate to suggest to a new user that they set up a light sail server. Um, so, I mean, I definitely think that there's a lower barrier of entry to serverless. It's, it is harder to debug, but I would also argue that those users probably aren't enabled to do that debugging on EC2 either. Cool, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's have a hand for Erica.